Mythological units are the big centerpiece of the new Total War Troy Mythos DLC. From the dreaded Hydra to the Howling Cerberus, you'll have more than your fill of mythology to dive into. I've gone into a lot of the big changes in the video linked in the upper right corner, but I wanted to give some love to the existing units in the game. In the original release of Troy, we get a number of units from Greek mythology, such as Centaurs, the Minotaur, and Corbantus. But... With that, we got the truth behind the myth representation, so you know, a dude on stilts with an animal skull on his head. Now, with all the new goodies, all the old units not only get a true-to-myth spin on them, but they also get a lot more unit variety, like a lot of different versions of centaurs and giants. There have been plenty of videos out there showing off the new units and their stats, but today I want to go into the lore and mythology behind all of these units. So here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to show you the truth behind the myth representation, then transition it to the new Mythos DLC version, so you can see a hard juxtaposition between the two game modes. Then I'll give you a few minutes of mythology about each unit just a, as a bit of a different take on showing off the unit roster. I hope you guys enjoyed this. It sort of blends my love for lore and Total War in a different way. I won't be showing off the new Mythos Big Daddy units and their retinues. I'll be saving those for larger videos dedicated to each one. If you're enjoying this type of content, guys, please don't forget to comment, like, and or subscribe. Each one of those things helps out in varying degrees, and I cannot stress how important it is to defeating the dreaded YouTube algorithm. If you'd like to support the channel, you can find any kind of relevant links in the description and pinned comment, but let's get started on the mythology behind Total War Troy Mythos' DLC. And we'll start off with the Harpies. And in Homer, the Harpies are the winds in a storm personified, you know, carrying people away on their quote-unquote wings. Their most famous role, however, is in the Argonautica. Here they torment a king called Phineas for offending the gods in you know, just some heinous way. And the Harpies torture him by carrying away his food or... You know, taking huge shits on it whenever they can't carry it away. In other stories, they continuously peck at him, driving him to the four corners of the world. However, when he is visited by the crew of the Argo, including two sons of Boreas, and remember uh, Boreas is the North Wind, who successfully pursue the Harpies with the blessing of Zeus and the help of the rainbow goddess Iris, and force them to swear on the river Styx that they would leave Phineas alone. In the game, they are basically a force of all-women bandits, while in the myths, they are more like the punishing hounds of the gods until, uh, with Zeus's permission, they are driven off. And we even get that um, in some of the lore blurbs of the game, it, it mentions that they are the hounds of Zeus. And they're still, like in you know, every other pop culture, incredibly cruel and savage, taking great delight in defiling Phineas's food and you know, tormenting him, reducing him to an emaciated ghost of a man, unable to even crawl from his table. Next, we'll move over here to the Sirens, and the Sirens of Greek mythology differ from that of maritime lore. When we think of a siren, we commonly associate them with beautiful mermaids that sing songs just off the side of a ship or on some rocks, taunting and wooing men to jump overboard. In doing so, the beautiful maiden is replaced with a voracious predator, dragging the sailors to the depths. In Greek mythology, their role is very similar, only they take on the appearance of both woman and bird. A lot of early representations of sirens are that of birds with human heads. Towards the latter classical period, they look quite similar to harpies, which the game takes on very well. In Argonautica, Chiron advises Jason to have Orpheus basically outplay the sirens in a rap battle as they cross by their path in their journey, playing songs more beautifully than the companions of Persephone can sing. Even in the Odyssey, we get Odysseus tying himself to the mast of his ship and having his men plug their ears with earwax. This comes at the behest of the witch Circe. Odysseus told his men not to release him, no matter how hard he begged. And begged he did as the siren's song entered his ears. Finally, when they were out of earshot, his men unbound Odysseus. Which brings us to a fitting end for the Sirens. The myth goes that should any man hear their song and escape them, then they immediately plunge into the water and kill themselves. Talking about the Corbantus is a little different though here when we go into some of the mythology behind them. Because there's not a whole ton um, related to the Corbantus, especially nothing that would make them seem like large anthropomorphic lion men. And I think that's kind of a really cool, interesting take from Creative Assembly to do this. Um, in the game, it mentions that uh, the Corbantis who helped the greatest of gods, Zeus, were cursed by the most terrible of titans, Cronus. And in the mythology for the Corbantis, we have these individuals who... 
uh, distracted Kronos from eating Zeus by um, basically dancing and clanging their shields together a whole bunch, and it distracted Kronos long enough um, to distract him from the crying of Zeus, to be hidden away. So this, of course, creates the whole tale of Zeus then rebelling against Kronos and so on and so forth. And we get some influence of the Corbantis um, as... I guess you could say members of Cretan dancing cults or of the Phrygians, which were kind of like western portion, uh, western northern portion of Anatolia. Around, they're supposedly supposed to be like um, descendants, I guess you could say, of the Hittites in, in a lot of different ways. But of course, there's no real actual archaeological evidence to support that. So there's nothing really that I have been able to find or scoop up mythologically that would describe the Corbantis to be these half lion or, or lion, <laughs> anthropomorphic lion creatures. But it's definitely worth noting their importance in the mythology of Zeus and Kronos and how they distracted Kronos to kind of help hide Zeus away. Moving into another very classical Greek mythological unit, we get the centaurs. Now, centaurs appear in many local legends and other stories in Greek myth and appear very frequently in Greek art. Uh, at their core, the centaurs are perceived as beastmen who mostly live as raiders. They represent uh, fertility, barbarism, general horseback savagery, you know, a personification of the Greek stereotyped image of the barbarian. The centaurs, as the personification, again, of wilderness and nature's unbridled savagery, are almost always the enemy in many Greek stories. There is one exception, however, though, and I, I think we all know who I'm about to talk about, the wise, ancient, and immortal Chiron. Now, Chiron is known for teaching the young Aeneas, Achilles, a number of other individuals in classic Greek uh, lore and mythology. It kind of just becomes like a trope, right? Like, oh yeah, they were taught by Chiron. Of course they were. But again, he teaches Achilles all these virtues of life and how to be an artistic and learned man. You know, Heracles was also taught by uh, Chiron. And in one second century story, the hero was fighting off a tribe of centaurs who fled from him and then into Chiron's abode. Shooting an arrow into the group, he accidentally hits Chiron. Now Heracles, you know, mortified by his actions, sought to heal the old and immortal centaur using Chiron's own teachings, but was unable to do so, and Chiron suffered endlessly for Heracles' folly. Prometheus eventually then proposes to Zeus and Heracles that the latter, Heracles, could take up Chiron's immortality, allowing the centaur to finally die in peace. In many artworks, the, the centaurs are, are they're kind of personified as the barbarian enemies of the city-state, and thus in the game, you know, they're shown as sort of a proto-Scythian tribe of horse-riding mercenaries and barbarians, which is also, let it be known, extremely uncommon in the Bronze Age. A horse was a beast of burden back then, and all, um, in all intents and purposes, too, it was um, a thing used for sacrifice and or food as well. So horse riding was just simply not something you did. If anything, horses were ridden to combat and then dismounted because there was a fear of either losing the horse or falling off the horse and dying outright. Now, another unit that CA seems to have taken a little bit of a license with is the Spartoi. Now, the Spartoi appear in two prolific stories. In the first, the mythological founder of Thebes, Cadmus was in the process of sacrificing a sacred cow to the gods. This was kind of ordered to him by the Oracle of Delphi. And he told his men to search for water first, and they found a great spring guarded by a dragon. Cadmus was successful in killing the dragon at great cost to his band of men, but bad luck, it was the son of Ares, the, the dragon that is, the god of war. Athena appeared and told him to sow one half the dragon's teeth into the ground, from which sprung the Spartoi, fully decked out in the best armor and with the best weapons. You know, they're, they're grandsons of Ares. You'd expect this. But fearing these, you know, heavily armed men, he threw a rock among them, Cadmus, that is. And what this did was it confused them because it thought that uh, the, the Spartoi thought that one of the other ones threw a rock at them, and it caused them all to fight and essentially 
kill each other until there was only five left. These last five Spartoi joined Cadmus in founding Thebes and were known as great elders and leaders of the city, while Cadmus spent eight years as the war god's slave and eventually married Ares' daughter. And this is where the Theban um, uh, aristocracy derives its uh, um, its its roots from is in the Spartoi. But the role in the second story, story, the Argonautica, is much the same. Athena gave the other half of Cadmus's teeth to the king of Colchis, who told Jason to sew them in order to win the Golden Fleece. He did this and was about to be killed by the Spartoi until he did the same trick Cadmus performed on them. They subsequently all killed each other in a frenzy. And the way the game represents this too is you get an ability that says, you know, uh, Seed of the Dragon. And all of the units in the mythology version have the same crumbling mechanic that the undead do in Total War Warhammer. As you start to lose the battle, these guys kind of uh, crumble and fade away. Very, very cool. And the way that uh, CA has kind of represented them too is more like skeletons if you look at the descriptions of some of the abilities it even says okay these guys are skeletons made of earth and their old um uh, one of their old greek names actually means like from the earth so it's a very interesting kind of spin that creative assembly has taken on it with the actual mythological portion of this making them of course decked out in this this armor but also making them a creature of sand and dust is what it's actually supposed to be i'm sorry not of earth of sand and dust is what the uh, the greek word for them actually is so very interesting take from ca for these guys now we get to talk about the perfect representation of Jason Momoa in Total War Troy, the Giants. Now, Greek mythology has Giants in a classic, if relatively unexciting, role. Theirs is to war against the gods, a classic tale of good versus evil, in the lose as all enemies of the gods always do. Alsonius, a king of the Giants, was killed by Heracles after he did a particularly heinous crime. He stole the cattle of Helios, the sun god. And remember, cattle is a sign of prosperity and wealth in Greek society. So this is, like I said, a very heinous crime. Zeus then sends Heracles after him for this affront. And this story, the uh, Gigantomachia, the War of the Giants, has Heracles in a leading role as this giant killer and you know punishes them for attempting to dethrone the natural rulers of the cosmos. It goes over the top, right? You know, filling them with arrows while Zeus throws lightning bolts and Athena smashes them with her Gorgon shield. It's uh, the only thing missing is someone teabagging them at this point. But this giant killing is a sign of Heracles' divinity. But it also shows that the giants, in their role as this barbarous natural enemy for the gods, and their worldview as, as that kind of extends to it, of the Greeks themselves. In the game, they fit this idea with the making of barbarian mercenary forces quite, quite well. And we get them across the map in a lot of different ways. Uh, these guys are also, you know, the children of Gaia. The, these are a offspring of the Titan. And what's really interesting interesting too is when you're playing the game when you play the mythos version almost all the mythos units speak in greek while the uh, truth behind the myth units almost all speak in english so it's a very kind of cool uh, difference between the two moving on to our final two big daddies we have the cyclops now there are two types of cyclops or cyclopes in greek mythology the three elder cyclops the brothers brontes Dariopes and Argus, and the later younger Cyclops, a tribe of giants living outside of Greek, myth Greek uh, society. The three elder Cyclops were siblings of the Titans and helped the gods by forging the magical weapons of Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, as well as the altar on which the gods swore their oaths of alliance against the Titans. And this is kind of the origin story of where we get greeks swearing oaths on sacred altars it's all because of that grand oath between the three brothers but these cyclops were smiths and allies of the gods in homeric myth the cyclops were a tribe of giants personifying you guessed it barbarism the most famous of which is polyphemus who was tricked and blinded by odysseus for capturing him and his men in order to eat them they are you know again rather similar in their role to the centaurs and of course in their role as giants with polyphemus being the son of poseidon and gaia and like i said before giants are called that because they are children of gaia gigantes and in the game even when you play the truth behind the myth version 
the Cyclops will say uh, Wrath of Poseidon or, or um, Descendant of Poseidon, and they have abilities that again, link them to Poseidon. So it's really cool that Creative Assembly has even sprinkled that into the Truth Behind the Myth for, uh, version, less so in the Mythos version because the Cyclops speak Greek in the Mythos version, which is pretty cool. Last but certainly not least is the Minotaur, probably my favorite unit of the mythological units we've talked about so far. And the Minotaur is perhaps the most famous of all Greek mythological units in the game aside of maybe the hydra or the cerberus but to get into the lore of this a little bit king minos of crete offended the sea god poseidon by refusing to sacrifice a beautiful bull to him so poseidon punished him by making his wife fall in love with the bull birthing the monstrous minotaur flash forwarding a number of years we have a um kind of tribute owed to crete from Athens. So essentially Athens were or the Athenians were forced to send seven boys and seven girls into the Minotaur's labyrinth to be savagely murdered and eaten. Simple, easy, right? The hero Theseus goes into the labyrinth and slays the beast, kind of quelling that uh, that overall terror. And this is a simple role for a very famous monster. But across the Greek-influenced Mediterranean, and, and going as far back as the Minoans, you know, this is thousands of years before classical Greece, bulls were held in great reverence. We have ritualistic drinking chalices in the shape of bull heads. Bull jumping was a daring sport on Minoan Crete, and bulls were thought of as one of the greatest sacrifices for the gods. So this sort of duality makes the Minotaur a very striking and almost blasphemous monster. He is both a blessing and a curse on Minos, who was unable to kill the monster himself for fear of angering Poseidon further. So with that, we, we really bring a conclusion here to this discussion of mythology behind each and every one of these units. And some of them don't have a huge expansive mythology behind them, right? When we take a look at the Spartoi or the Corbantis, it's a little bit more subdued, especially when we look at the Corbantis, right? There's barely any information on them. So it's fun to see how Creative Assembly has taken the notion of these two looked at maybe their Greek root words and what they kind of come from and made their own spin on them, which makes them very fun and exciting. Or they took more classical approaches when you look at stuff like the Minotaur or the uh, Cyclops. And the overall aesthetic of a lot of these things kind of has that, that uh, old hollywood interpretation in a lot of ways right when you think of clash of the titans you almost get that claymation look when you look at the cyclops which i think kind of creates a little bit of nostalgia factor and makes it a little bit more fun but also really drums up this over the top mythological representation of these creatures in total war troy which i really love so go ahead and let in the comment section wait Go ahead and let me know in the comment section below if you enjoyed this type of content. I'm actually going to be doing, I want to do three full length kind of featurettes on the Griffin, the Cerberus, and the Hydra, where I don't really show any gameplay of Total War Troy. In fact, I won't, I, I might have them a little bit here and there to kind of show some cool animations and attack stuff because that's kind of nifty from a narrative perspective. But for the most part, it would be me pulling um, historical or archaeological stuff from pottery art or hand-drawn pictures that I'll have put into the video, stuff like that. So go ahead and let me know if that sounds cool to you to kind of have a lore video that is not Warhammer-based but is actually rooted in Greek mythology. It's something I've been kind of kicking around for a long time, and Total War Troy is kind of that perfect opportunity. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Go ahead and again, let me know in the comment section below um, if there's any more of the, the lore or the mythology of these creatures that you want to expand on, maybe something that's a little less known and you want to go into, by all means, share it. Let it be known in the comment section below. But as always, have a good one and take care.